treatment for their base positivity is still not reliable. On missing out the base positivity, we can have the local tissue infiltration or orbital infiltra uh, invasion, which may require either enucleation or excentration in the worst case scenarios. With this in mind, the purpose of the study was the efficacy and the safety of ruthenium plaque brachytherapy in the treatment of invasive OSSN. It was a retrospective, consecutive interventional case series of 68 eyes presenting with primary or recurrent OSSN for a, over a period of 14 years. A detailed slit lamp examination with a preoperative ASOC or UBM in a clinically suspected cases was done. All the patients underwent a wide excision biopsy with alcohol keratoepithelectomy for the corneal involvement, sclamular sclerectomy for the scale involvement, and the cryotherapy to the resected edges. In primary plaque brachytherapy was done in the same sitting if base was found involved either preoperatively or intraoperatively. Whereas secondary plaque brachytherapy was done in the cases of base involvement with on histopathology confirmation. This is a figure one showing the corneal scale uh, involvement in a clinical picture and on OSO city. On the right hand side, the histopathology shows the uh, corneal epithelium thickening with the yellow arrow and the green arrow is showing the corneal stromal infiltration. Coming to the figure two and three, these are the corneal scale uh, involvement on a 54 year old male and a 48 year old female respectively. In figure two, we can see the same on the UBM and in figure three, we can see the same on the intraoperative ASOCT. All were assessed for the tumor regression vision and eye salvage, rate of metastasis, and complications. Now coming to the results, the median age was 52 years with the male preponderance. Clinically, 18 patients were suspected to have base involvement, whereas on histopathology, 87% had scleral involvement, whereas 47 had corneal involvement. The all, all patients underwent the ruthenium plaque brachytherapy uh, in, including the one-fourth of the primary plaque brachytherapy where it was done in the primary setting itself. The mean interval between the primary excision and the secondary plaque brachytherapy was approximately six weeks. All had received a median dose of 5,000 centigrade for a 2 mm depth for over 20 hours. Over a follow-up period of 30 months, the local control was 94%. The vision was salvageable in 93% with 52 eyes having more than or equal to two lines of improvement on snail chart. We had a 94% globe salvage and a 100% life salvage with a 0% zero per zero of metastasis. Three patients had a recurrent lesions which were well treated by the repeat excision biopsy and the plaque brachytherapy. And the eye with the new lesion was treated with the excision alone. The there were 16 patients which had the visual loss, including the six having, having the cataract-related reversible visual loss. Coming to the review of literature, this was the largest series uh, to, uh, to the best of our knowledge in the world. With the local control comparable to Arepel et al. and the vision salvage and the globe salvage rates were better than that with the minimal complications. Here, in our study, we, uh, we recommend that the Blackberry therapy was not only was not used and was used as adjuvant therapy and not as a primary treatment. We also indicated that histopathology is the most important guiding tool. Finally, we conclude that ruthenium plaque brachytherapy is effective in local control, vision salvage, and eye salvage. With the experience spanning over 40, uh, 14 years, we can uh, confidently say that the ruthenium plaque brachytherapy has a uh, gratifying outcome in controlling the base involvement. We would like to uh, recommend that all the patient with invasive OSSN should undergo a white excision biopsy with lamellar sclerectomy if required, with alcohol keratoepithelectomy if required. The base involvement should be ruled out by a specialist ocular pathologist if base turn out to be a negative, a periodic observation will suffice, whereas if a base is positive, a surface plaque brachytherapy is a must. 
these are these are my references thank you okay nice presentation gaurav and congratulations for this work uh, i just have two questions here first is uh, were any of these patients treated with interferons i mean your study has been spanning 14 years and of late interferons have become you know very popular in the management of oss and yes ma'am so were any of these cases treated no ma'am none of the patients were treated with the interferon because uh, uh, when i was working as a fellow with dr honawa uh only the surface oss and only the oss which are not invasive they were treated with the interferon drops or injection and whenever they we find any invasion we used to go with the plaque brachytherapy all right and question 2 is was amniotic membrane grafting used for any of these patients yes ma'am all the patient underwent the amniotic membrane graft if the uh, direct repair was not possible all right thank you any other questions from the panel nice presentation thank you thank you So uh, the next speaker is Dr. Swati Kalki. She'll be speaking on artificial intelligence and machine learning in ocular oncology retinoblastoma. A very good morning. So I'll be talking about a very good morning. So I'll be talking about artificial intelligence and machine learning in retinoblastoma. I do not have any financial disclosures to make. Now the use of artificial intelligence in medicine has become very popular in the past decade and it is increasingly used for, uh, in various fields like cardiology radiology etc <coughs> and it is mainly based on two parameters one the numerical data where we use parameters like heart rate respiratory rate etc or image based where uh, mri or ct images or pathology images are used for uh, developing ai model In ophthalmology, it is very popular for conditions such as diabetic retinopathy and uh, cataract, etc. Now, when we look at ocular oncology, not much is done in AI field, and so we we wanted to explore for retinoblastoma. And if we look at our database, most of the malignant eye tumors that we see are retinoblastoma, and it is a tumor that affects children less than three years of age, and most of them present with very advanced disease, mainly because there is no routine fundus screening that is performed in newborns. over the years we have uh, a large image database of the retcam images which we capture in every child and so we thought we will use these images to develop the ai model the purpose of this study is to explore the utility of artificial intelligence and machine learning for diagnosis of retinoblastoma and if diagnosed to classify the intraocular retinoblastoma the method that was used is these uh, retcam images were first extracted they were manually studied by uh, two separate experts and then these images were fed into the machine and various algorithms were used to develop the ai model now if such an image is shown obviously it is it will be reported as normal if a small tumor like this it will be a group a tumor if a larger tumor a group b tumor if it is a tumor with localized seeds then it will be group c if diffuse seeds group d and if it's an extensive tumor group e tumor now multi label classification model was used for identification of optic disc and tumor where it can identify the tumor or optic disc by a bounding box with confidence interval whenever optic disc was seen uh, the machine was taught that the optic disc size is 1.5 mm so the tumor size was calculated accordingly whenever the uh, optic disc was not seen the machine was uh, taught that the circle within which the image is there it measures approximately 12 mm and the size was calculated accordingly now for identification of seeds open cv algorithm with potential region of interest was identified and once the region of interest was uh, identified deep learning model was used to identify the subretinal and the vitreous seeds now ai model was trained to identify the optic disc the tumor the size of the tumor the distance of the tumor from the optic disc the distance of the seeds from the main tumor etc with this the image analysis was performed on 771 images of 109 eyes of which 78 eyes harbored retinoblastoma and 31 were normal when two experts studied them the inter observer variability was less than 1% for individual images for cumulative images that is inter observer variability was 0% that means each eye would have more than one image minimum being four images maximum being 20 images per eye for example if this image is shown it will be reported as normal but if the different quadrant of the same 
i is shown, it will be reported as group C because there is a tumor with localized seed. But if we go to further quadrant where we see diffuse seeds, it will be reported as group D. And there is another tumor in another quadrant where there is a large tumor with diffuse seeding. So ultimately, this cumulative uh, reading will be a group D i. The AI model, when it was used, the accuracy in detection of retinoblastoma was 95%. And classification as per group, accuracy was 85%. However, there were missed diagnoses in 3% eyes, over classification in 9%, under classification in less than 1%, and misclassification of normal as RB in 2% eyes. If you look at the sensitivity and specificity, it was very good for detection of retinoblastoma. The specificity was good for uh, grouping from group A to E. However, the sensitivity was variable from 63% to 100%. Conclusion is that AI model is a promising tool for diagnosis of retinoblastoma. It may be useful in classification of intraocular RB as well. The strengths of this study is that it's a first AI model for RB. It can serve as a useful screening tool and it has very high sensitivity and specificity for differentiating normal versus a retinoblastoma eye. However, there are limitations that we developed this tool by feeding only the normal and retinoblastoma images. We did not feed other pathologies, so we cannot comment on whether it can identify other pathologies. The sensitivity was varying between 63 to 100%, and there was unequal distribution of images in each group. The future plan is to increase the sample size and use other machine learning models to improve the accuracy. The ultimate goal is that if anybody can take fundus images and send it to reading center, the AI model should be able to say whether there, were, there is retinoblastoma. For example, if this image comes, it should be reported as normal. But if such an image comes, it should detect that there is retinoblastoma, and this patient needs to be referred immediately. Thank you very much. Thank you, Swati. That is excellent work. Uh, just one comment here that, uh, as you mentioned, you know, we often get cases of pseudo-retinoblastoma. Right. And uh, that is where, you know, it becomes even more challenging. So how do you see the future of AI come, you know, when we, have, we deal with such cases? Yeah, thanks, Bhavna, for the question. I think uh, this is the first step. Uh, we definitely aim to expand it to other pathologies as well. But the AI model can definitely tell whether it is normal or not normal. That can be definitely known. The second step, of course, we want to put in different pathologies and see if it can differentiate different pathologies. At this point of time, at least it can differentiate what is normal and what is not normal, which I think is a starting step for any AI model. Great, thank you. Anybody else? Fascinating presentation, Dr. Swati. Uh, as we all know, uh, screening in retinoblastoma has always been a, a topic of much uh, uh, conundrum. Uh, how do you, so uh, uh, first would you like to comment upon the cost implications of uh, applying uh, AIML uh, model for at vision centers because that is probably yeah, where yeah. we would uh, find implication of this. Correct. Yeah, I think this is, so first we wanted to have something, an AI model where we know that once we have fundus images, we have something to assess it. Uh, so we are also working on developing a low cost fundus camera where any like you know vision technician who is not a doctor can also just non midriatic pupil they can still take images so that will be the next step like you no know, next future plan where we will be using a low cost cam uh, the images captured with a low cost non midriatic uh, camera and then we will see if we can apply this ai model but first we wanted to have a base so that we know that okay these images will be helpful so that's the reason that we started there but we are also working back end for the other way for that's great. Thank the other you. images as well. We, yeah, we definitely hope that early diagnosis and early detection would be possible with Im uh, implications of all of these technologies. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Swati. Thank you very much. Uh, the next presentation is on association of P53 gene mutation in various eye eyelid ca carcinomas by Dr. S Sanjay Bosak. Good morning to all. Uh, I'm uh, going to talk uh, about the association of P53 <laughs> mutation in various eyelid carcinomas. Uh, uh, eyelid, ca eyelid tumors are most frequently observed in ophthalmic practice, accounting for 5% of all skin cancers. In United States, basal cell carcinoma is the most common human eyelid cancer, accounting for 90% of the eyelid tumors. Squamous cell carcinoma is the second most common malignancy of eyelid in uh, eyelid cancer in uh, 
Caucasian accounting for 10 to 20 percent of malignant tumors and 5 percent of eyelid tumors. Potentially, the sebaceous gland carcinoma is more fatal eyelid malignancy ac accounting for only 1 percent in United States. However, in Asia, the sebaceous gland carcinoma is the most common malignant tumor uh, representing about 25 to 40 percent of all malignant eyelid tumors. Malignant melanoma is uh, encountered rarely representing 1% of all malignancy but contributes a more higher proportion of death. It is a well-known fact that the carci carcinogenesis starts with genetic alteration in either one of the gene which are proto-oncogene, DNA repair, uh, repair gene and tumor suppressor gene. The tumor proteins P53 is a well-known tumor suppressor gene and has been associated with a variety of cancers. The gene was first discovered in 1979. The P53 gene is regarded as the guardian of genome. Normally kept at low level in healthy cells, but uh, activated by oxidative stress and DNA damage. The P P53 gene induces apoptosis when DNA damage occurs but may lead to uncontrolled proliferation of cells and genetic instability when it fails. The P53 mutations in sebaceous gland carcinoma, as suggested by its overexpression, indicate it is to have a possibly key role in UV radiation exposure and subsequent signal alteration. The present, present study aimed to determine the frequency of P53 gene mutation in various eyelid carcinomas and to investigate its clinico-pathological correlations and prognostic significances in a clinical population comprised of normal uh, North Indian region. Material and method used for this. Uh, this is a cross-sectional hospital-based study was conducted over one year uh, in the Department of Ophthalmology, uh, RIO, IMS, BHU. The study was conducted following the declaration of Helmsky and approved by Ethical Committee of IMS BHU. All the patients were uh, enrolled after getting the informed consent. The sample was collected from patients with various eyelid carcinomas which selected according to inclusion and exclusion criteria. 20 newly diagnosed and histologically confirmed patients with primary eyelid carcinoma without earlier exposure to chemotherapy or radiotherapy were in included in the present study. The detailed clinic, clinical radiological finding of all patients were recorded. These samples were taken either by incisional or excisional, excisional biopsy. The hematoxylene and eosin stand sections were examined to confirm the pathological diagnosis and to find out histo histopathological differentiations. F uh, FNAC was done from metastatic lymph node whenever present. The TNM staging was done according to the guidelines of AJCCS. Blood sampling and DNA isolation. 3 to 5 ml uh, peripheral venous blood was collected under a septic precaution from all patients in EDTA coated vials uh, through venopuncture of anticuvital vein. DNA isolation was done following a standard protocol and dissolved in trice EDTA buffer. It was followed by measurement of DNA concentration by nano drop spectrometer. Mutation analysis and sequencing. The mutation analysis of P53 gene of patients was carried out by amplifying target region that is exon 5 to 9 and intervening intronic using polymerase chain reaction and screening of mutations by sequencing. Primers used for PCR amplification of target region were designed using primer 3 software version 4. For P53 gene, exon 5 to 9 using sequence from the NCBI gene, and the primer were <coughs> primers were used amplifying by thermocycler. DNA sequencing was used to screening or verify the candidate gene, candidate gene in the uh, relevant affected individual. PCR products were first purified by using exosub protocol. Uh, briefly, PCR uh, amplified DNA fragments were subjected to agarose gel electrophoresis purified and sequenced using Sanger DNA sequencing method. Data analysis was performed by software FinsTV viewer. 
the chi square test for equal proportions and fisher's exact probability test was used for categorical variables p53 uh, p value less than 0.5 0.05 were considered statistically significant. Statistical analysis in the present study was carried out by using SPSS 19 packages. Uh, the results of this study is, in the present study, a cohort of 20 patients who had controlled with various types of eyelid carcinoma were enrolled. Out of these, 25% were male and 75% were female in the group, age group 31 to 80 years. The maximum case case occurrence were noted in the age group of 61 to 70. The frequency of eyelid carcinoma tended to increase with age. The majority of patients belongs to lower socio socioeconomic status and rural background. All patients had unilateral involvement, about 40% had a right eye involvement, while 60% had left eye involvement, as shown in the table one. The uh, male is 25% only and the female is 75% and the maximum is 40% uh, in 61 to 70 years group and uh, rural background uh, are the major patients. Uh, histopathological uh, examination saw uh, contribution of sebaceous gland carcinoma to be most prevalent followed by vessel cell carcinoma that is 45% and squamous cell carcinoma is 5%. That is uh, max, maximum uh, contribution is of 50% in sebaceous gland carcinoma in our study. Surprisingly, most of the sebaceous gland carcinoma observed were in the upper lid, while basal cell carcinoma in the lower lid. This is the uh, microphotographs of uh, histological section. Uh, that is uh, B number, that is uh, uh, sebaceous gland carcinoma moderately differentiated showing lobulated uh, lobules of malignant cells with sebaceous differentiation and basal cell carcinoma showing uh, ne nests of pigment uh, laden atypical basal cell. PCR amplified exons 5 to 9 of the P53 gene were separated on 2% agarose gel and sequenced. The multiple sequence alignment found no sequential variation, sequence variation in exon 5, 6, and 9 of the gene. The uh, GT transversion were uh, identified in exon 7 and at of 4% four, uh, 4 only in 8 patient. Could you sum up? Yeah, could you sum up? Uh, Time actually, is over. Thank you. Actually, uh, in our study, we found uh, there is uh, total uh, uh, genetic mutations in uh, 14, that is 6 in uh, 6 is uh, exonic variation and uh, 8 is intronic variation. We found uh, five, uh, in 6 exonic variation, 5 is frame shift mutation and 1 is, uh, there is uh, deletion uh, in one case. So, uh, and uh, by this study we can assess the, uh, we can uh, say that P53 gene can be a, a marker and we can assess the uh, tumors earlier by this. Okay, thank you. So, uh, what is the novelty of this study? Novelty is, uh, uh, there is uh, more than, uh, actually uh, the novel uh, poly uh, polymorphic uh, genetic variation is not causing the cancerous almost all time because it is environmental changes, uh, due to environmental changes there may be uh, novel variations. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So the next presentation is uh, on immune profiling of COVID-associated rhino-orbital cerebral mucormycosis by Dr. Roshmi Gupta. There's no pointer, right? Good morning. Talking about the immune profiling of COVID-associated rhino orbital cerebral mucormycosis. And why is this paper in a pathology session? Well, what the invader does is microbiology, and what the host tissue does is pathology. And that's how we are talking about it in the pathology session. 
uh, we got financial grants from the Naira Netrale Foundation and ICMR. Last year, I don't really need to remind this audience, a little before this time, we went through this epidemic, epidemic of mucomycosis, which led to disfigurement, loss of function of affected organ, and mortality. There were thousands of patients affected, leading to up to 14% mortality. So what exactly led to this? First of all, the microbiome. The first one? The microbiome, where we know that the Indian uh, microbiome is full of the spores. The next thing we talked about is the physiological factors, the metabolic condition of the patient. And the third thing is the host defense. And here, please pay attention, because the host defense comprises cells, cytokines, and among the cells, the normative data and methods for diagnosing are already available. So this was another publication from our group where we found that history of steroid use and control of diabetes mellitus was very significant in a case control study. And when we did an ROC curve, high sugar level more than 178 had the highest sensitivity and specificity to diagnosing mucomycosis. There was an overlap, as seen in the Venn diagram, between diabetes, use of steroid, and high blood sugar. However, there was still a, another segment of patients who did not have any of these factors, yet developed muca. Conversely, there were patients who had high sugar but did not develop muca. So that brings us to the host immunity. What happens when the spore invades the tissue? It can be phagocytosed, or if it is allowed to project the hyphae, then the cellular immunity comes into play. The neutrophils are drawn in by the cytokines, and then they bring in a host of other factors, including natural killer cells. We know from beforehand, that's our conventional teaching, that neutrophils form the primary defense, and neutropenia is attributed as a major risk factor. But if, again, once again, I don't need to remind you people that we found that this set of patients that we encountered last year all had neutrophilia, not neutropenia, very high WBC counts. So what is the status of antifungal immune compartment in patients with COVID-associated ROCM? The hypothesis is that there's an altered cellular and humoral factor which is relevant. So the objective is to determine the immune cell subset profile and determine the secreted immune factor profile. This is a cross-sectional observational study with healthy controls seven, C minus, R minus, no ROCM plus, but COVID positive, C plus, R minus, and COVID positive, ROCM positive, C plus, R plus. So we had the matching criteria between the control and cases with post-COVID recovery with the same duration, COVID severity matched and COVID-19 medication matched. Sample type was peripheral blood with anticoagulant. And we checked the immune cell profile and immune secreted mediators profile by flow cytometry and ELISA. Uh, the clinical cohort, if you look at this, the uh, composition of these groups were fairly similar in gender, age, duration of COVID, and severity of COVID. The RBS in obviously C plus R plus group was much higher than that in C plus R minus group. So now you understand there are a lot of parameters in a lot of patients. So when you have so much data, so much multidimensional data, PCA plot, the principal component analysis plot is one way to simplify it down. And here you can see the other patients, non-ROCM patients, had a similar profile, whereas the ROCM patients had a similar profile. When you look at the heat map, if you look at the immune cell subsets, the green ones are where the cells are increased, neutrophils are increased, and the purple ones are where they're decreased. And you see NK cells here are decreased. Among the adaptive immune cells, once again, CD8 cells are increased. 
and lymphocyte CD4 are decreased. There's no difference between the C minus R minus and C plus R minus groups. Among the secreted immune factors, what was significantly lower was the angiogenin. When we put this on a graph, the, this is a log uh, depiction. So therefore, you'll see that the NK cells dropped by almost 100 times. And when we drew the ROC curve of that, we find cutoff of NK cells less than 1.85% is almost 100% sensitive and specific. So NK cells and fungal infections have been shown prior to have invasive uh, fungal infections. And angiogenin is a class of microbicidal proteins, even though it was initially found as an inducer of blood vessel genesis. So this study adds that there are novel contributors to ROCM susceptibility, and we need to study the mechanism. It can be used for possibly screening and stratification of transplant patients who already have a low immunity, and prognostication to antifungal treatment. This was a collaborative work between the clinical team of Nara Netrale and the GROW Research Lab of Nara Netrale Foundation, and thanks to our patient volunteers. Thank you. Thank you, Rashmi. That's inspiring work. Um, one question. Uh, could you elaborate a little bit on how these findings could guide clinical management? Yeah. So, like we said, one of the major guidelines now has been the level of blood sugar and the duration from COVID. But let us look at a possibility of where we can go more generalized. Since NK cells are so specific, and there are already diagnostic tools available for detecting the level of NK cells. And in the Indian population, the normative data is available. It's 2% to 50%. And in all these patients, it was below that 2%. So if you have an immunocompromised patient, other than only doing the uh, WBC counts, if you do an NK cell profile, you might know that this is a patient particularly susceptible for fungal infection maybe mucomycosis, maybe the others. And so these would probably go on antifungals at the earliest um, symptoms appearing. So this actually has a lot of implication beyond the past pandemic. Thank you. Thank you. Very, very nice presentation, Dr. Roshmi. I think what uh, the pandemic and the epidemic of mucormycosis gave us is more uh, patients uh, sample because uh, mucormycosis was not this widely studied before being a rare uh, occurrence. Uh, and uh, I think what your study rightly points out is also uh, that apart from the known risk factors or the confounding risk factors, uh, there might be objective criteria which might be able to uh, detect early uh, uh, right. profile of these patients. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Roshmi. So the next speaker is um, Dr. Ha Harika Rigani on multimodal management of orbital rhabdomyosarcoma can optimize eye and life salvage. Good morning. Uh, so uh, today I'm, I'll be presenting my uh, study on uh, multimodal management in orbital rhabdomyosarcoma can optimize eye and life salvage. I have no financial interest to disclose. So rhabdomyosarcoma is a highly malignant and most common soft tissue sarcoma of the head and neck in the childhood. It comprises 4% of all pediatric malignancies and 10% of all the cases occur in the orbit. So uh, prior to 1960s, the overall survival was 25% with the historically recommended treatment being exenteration. And with the corporate group trials, when the surgery is combined with the chemotherapy and the radiotherapy, the overall survival have been improved over 90%. So we aim to evaluate the outcomes of orbital rhabdomyosarcoma by multimodal management. This was a retrospective interventional case series in 40 consecutive orbital rhabdomyosarcoma cases managed with a multimodal protocol. The outcome measures were local tumor control, eye salvage, and metastasis. So this was the uh, protocol we followed. 
uh, surgery, which could either be incision or the excision biopsy, followed by histopathological confirmation of the diagnosis, then chemotherapy with wing Christian actinomycin D cyclophosphamide, alternating with ephosphamide and etoposide for three cycles, then followed by stereotactic radiotherapy with 4,500 4, to 5,500 centigrade, then continuing chemotherapy to complete six cycles. So the mean age was eight years, ranging from one month to 40 years. There was no gender predisposition seen. And the most common clinical presentation was proptosis seen in 55% of the cases, followed by diminution of vision seen in 22% of the cases. The other clinical presentations were pain, ptosis, and diplopia. The most of the patients had acute and subacute mode of presentation, and only eight patients had a chronic presentation. The most of the patients ranging from 35 to 38 percent had reasonably good visual acuity at presentation. The clinical signs, the most common clinical sign we could see was an ocular motility restriction seen in 60 percent and also proptosis seen in 58 percent of the cases. The other clinical signs were conjunctival congestion, RAPD, ptosis, papillal edema, corneal exposure, choroidal folds, strabismus and optic atrophy. So this is a seven-year-old patient seen presented with proptosis and dystopia, and we can see the imaging with the CT orbit showing the anterior and the posterior extent of the tumor. And 12% 12 of the uh, 12 uh, patients presented only with the anterior presentation without any posterior extent of the tumor as seen in this photograph. So most commonly was uh, the incision biopsy done, which is done in 67% of the cases. Excision biopsy was done in 25%. And three patients, we could completely debulk the tumor, those in the anterior cases. The most common was embryonal variety on histopathology, followed by alveolar, anaplastic, and botryoid. So this is the management protocol uh, we discussed. Surgery followed by chemotherapy, then the radiotherapy, and again chemotherapy to complete six cycles. So this was the management uh, we followed from the children's oncology group. And uh, most of our patients uh, fell in uh, group three, that is chemotherapy plus radiotherapy. So uh, these are the dose regimens of the chemotherapy we followed. So uh, this is uh, one uh, a good uh, response after chemotherapy. This is the uh, pre-chemotherapy. And after chemotherapy, we can see a very good uh, reduction of the tumor size. So radiotherapy, which is very important, based on the, uh, the uh, amount of the residual disease, we would decide the radiation dose. If there is no residual disease, the dose given ranges from 4,500 to 5,000. And if there is any residual disease remaining, then we give it at a dose of 5,000 to 5,500 centigrade at a dose rate of 180 to 200 centigrade per each fraction. So this slide is uh, really important because of planning a good radiotherapy is very important to prevent any recurrence of the tumor. So we have to be very careful to instruct our ra uh, radio oncologist to cover the entire orbit up to the apex, the inferior orbital fissure, the superior orbital fissure, the inferior orbital foramina, and the optic canal. So uh, after uh, this uh, multimodal uh, management, we could see a regression in 83% of the cases. But unfortunately, due to loss of follow-up, we had uh, recurrence seen in 7% of the uh, seven, uh, seven patients. But again, with uh, this multimodal management with chemo and radiotherapy, we could achieve a final regression in 100% of the cases. The eye salvage was uh, achieved in most of the cases, but unfortunately, three patients had to undergo exenteration. But with a good customized ocular processes, we could provide them a reasonably good cosmetic outcome. So at a mean follow-up of uh, 42 months, three patients succumbed to distant metastasis. So this is the outcome of a few of our patients after this multimodal protocol. This is another patient. Again, one more patient. So a similar study was uh, done uh, in uh, 2001 by Shields et al. in th 33 patients. And the results in terms of local tumor outcome, the regional lymph node systemic outcome, and the mortality are comparable to our, uh, the results of our study. So the orbital rhabdomyosarcoma sarcoma can be lethal as it is prone for local recurrences and systemic metastasis. Survival outcome has drastically improved over the years with the addition of chemotherapy and radiotherapy in the management. Close follow-up is mandatory to watch for local recurrence. The recurrent tumors are also well treated with a multimodal management. So to conclude, the multimodal treatment including initial surgery followed by multidrug chemotherapy and stereotactic radiotherapy 
provides excellent chance of local tumor control that is 86% primary control and 100% secondary control and life salvage that is 92% as in our study in cases of advanced orbital rhabdomyosarcoma. So our study emphasizes on a multimodal protocol with chemo and a properly planned radiotherapy to prevent any recurrence and also a very close follow-up to watch for the recurrence and again appropriate treatment to the, even to the recurrent cases with the same protocol. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you, Erica. Great work. Thank you. Uh, so one question I had was uh, three uh, patients succumbed. Yes, ma'am. If I heard correctly. So what do you think are the poor prognostic uh, factors or indicators? Uh, one is the extent of the tumor, ma'am. So the posterior compared to the anterior and the posterior, the posterior extended tumor uh, uh, patients had a relatively poor prognosis and the histopathological type, the anaplastic uh, uh, variety has a very poor prognosis and also the patients uh, uh, who recurred, th those patients have a, a poor uh, prognostic uh, factors. So both clinical as well as histopathological yes, yes. factors contribute, contribute to, to the prognosis outcome. in your uh, yes, series. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. So the next speaker is uh, Dr. Brolika Bansal uh, on correlation of risk factors and adjuvant therapy in the area in the era of secondary enucleation in retinoblastoma. systems of retinoblastoma in prognosticating survival and eye salvage. Okay, she's not here. Okay. So the next speaker will be uh, Namita Kumari. Okay, the, on intra-arterial chemotherapy in refractory and advanced retinoblastoma, a game changer. Uh, a very good morning, everyone. I am talking about the today the intra-TA chemotherapy in refractory and advanced retinoblastoma, a game changer. I have no financial interest. So we all know that the systemic chemotherapy is the main step for the treatment in the retinoblastoma along with the focal therapy, and it has a very favorable result when it comes to the salvaging of eye of group A and B, C, nearly 100%. However, the systemic chemotherapy in cases of the advanced retinoblastoma of group D and E with diffuse vitreous seeds has shown the very limited results in terms of the eye salvage. However, over the, over the last uh, fast, uh, past decade, the targeted treatment in the form of intra arterial chemotherapy and intra vitreal chemotherapy has completely changed the treatment paradigm for the advanced cases of retinoblastoma and also improved the eye salvage in advanced cases. So many patients, as we know that in our setting, uh, presented with the group and D, and it accounts for nearly around 78% in case of the intraocular group, and inoculation remains the main stray of treatment. However, the sales et al. have shown that the group salvage in the 57% of the eyes with secondary IAC post-systemic chemotherapy in advanced retinoblastoma, in which the otherwise the inoculation remains the main stray of treatment. In the India also, the few studies have been done showing the promising result in the management of retinoblastoma using the advanced modalities like the intravitreal chemotherapy and intra chemotherapy. So the, uh, the aim of this study is to evaluate the efficacy of secondary intra chemotherapy as a globe salvage modality in advanced and refractive cases of retinoblastoma. So it is a basically the retrospective non-randomized case series of advanced intraocular retinoblastoma that patient refracted to the systemic chemotherapy. And the duration is the between uh, the, all the patients who have underwent the procedure between 2018 to 2021. 13 patients were included in this study. Coming to the methodology, the all patients with the unilateral and bilateral group D and E, according to the international classification, who underwent secondary and re uh, rescue uh, uh, intra TA chemotherapy during the ever mentioned period. All the patients underwent uh, standardized uh, ISC procedure by superselective ophthalmic RT catheterization. And then chemotherapeutic agents, uh, triple drug therapy were injected except in one. 
and the tumor status uh, were evaluated after the four weeks under anesthesia and the post op complication uh, immediate and uh, uh, on our final outcome including the visual uh, outcome and the globe salvage was documented so coming to the results, out of 13 patients, 12 patients have received the second day IEC after being primarily treated with the uh, systemic chemotherapy and focal therapies. And one patient has received the rescue IEC after recurrence of primary intra-RTA chemotherapy. And mean number of intra-RTA chemo uh, cycles was two. So overall, uh, in our study, the globe salvage rate is the 53.84% with mean follow-up of uh, 18 months. The three patients underwent inoculation and three patients eventually died because of the metastasis. So this table is the showing the demographic profile uh, of the patients. The mean age is around 32 months and a male and female bear uh, around six in the six. And seven patient has a bilateral disease and six patient has unilateral disease. And seven patient has group D disease and seven, six patient has group E disease prior to the procedure. So this is uh, the table showing the treatment details of the, all the patients. Uh, B also had the similar, the most common uh, post-adverse uh, effect uh, after procedure is that transient eyelid edema that is uh, also documented in other study. And the final uh, outcome, the seven patients uh, has shown the regression and in three patient, it, uh, patient died to the uh, uh, systemic metastasis and three patient the patient underwent inoculation. So coming to the discussion, the eye salvage rate in uh, group A and C is very comparable to the dose of systemic chemo uh, chemotherapy, almost 100%. However, for the globe salvage in D and I as, uh, E, I as are variable. In most st studies with advanced disease like group D and E, IEC is more effective than the systemic chemotherapy. Sales et al. also reported the similar in the five-year uh, data that 100% in group B and C and 86% in group and D. Uh, the overall eye salvage rate in our series is around the 53.84%. And for group D, it is around 57.14%. And for group E, that is the 54, 50%. So which is comparable to the previous studies. In a, uh, uh, we don't have the much data from India, so only the DC et al. Uh, has uh, studied this suspect. So in a study from the India, the DC et al has reported around 67% and 50% eye salvage at four year follow up for group D and E uh, respectively in the series of the 15 eyes. However, only two patients in that series has group E tumor. In our series, however, the six patients has a group E tumors and uh, all receive secondary IAC. So tumor recurrence can develop in the long term and might affect the globe salvage status. Hence, a longer follow-up will provide the final outcome of intra-tier chemotherapy is important. As Resetol also documented that the eye salvage uh, decreased from 93 to 66% at the four-year follow-up from the first year. So uh, the use of adjunct uh, uh, intra-tier chemotherapy along with uh, intra-tier chemotherapy can improve the globe salvage. And uh, since primary uh, intra-tier chemotherapy could not prevent the systemic metastasis, a combined approach of the cost-effective Systemic, uh, systemic chemotherapy and intra-tier chemotherapy can be optimal approach for this advanced disease. So the conclusion is that the IAC uh, salvage uh, intra-tier chemotherapy with triple drug following failure of systemic chemotherapy with other adjunct modalities will be cost effective and safe option for eye salvage in advanced retinoblastoma with a globe salvage rate of 53.84%. And it is also an effective approach to improve the treatment compliance and help in addressing the barrier of treatment refusal when inoculation is advised. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Namita. Very nice presentation. Couple of questions here. Yeah. So you used three drugs, yes, if I understand. Yeah. What was the rationale of using so three drugs? Ma'am, because this, uh, the, uh, all our the patient who went under the secondary IAC, so these are the tumor uh, size and the burden of the tumor is like more. The Abramson et al. also has reported with the triple drug therapy, they have a better outcome. And the, another issue is, ma'am, that is the cost effective because the, there's a cost effective of a single IAC. And these all patients are the poor patients. So for that, we uh, go on for the triple, uh, to maximize that uh, efficacy. Okay. Go 
and uh, so regarding the number of cycles of IIC provided, I saw it, it, you had a range from one to three, and your median was mean two. Is, mean is so two. what was the rationale behind, uh, uh, or how was it uh, seized after one cycle? A few of the patients just had one cycle of IIC. Yes. So did they then follow? It was it followed up by uh, systemic chemotherapy afterwards. Uh, or in some patient we have also given the synergistic uh, systemic chemotherapy also because uh, okay. yeah mm -hmm. in between the procedure so how was that scheduled so your IC were three weekly apart and then uh, along it's with not that like, sir, uh, after like after four weeks we still had uh, that we also have given the adjunct treatment in the form of like intravitreal chemo Depending that right. No, I'm talking about the syst uh, systemic chemotherapy. The the, the patients who like you stop the, uh, the uh, as I say, this is a cost-effective procedure also. Mm -hmm. Like when we are not getting the IAC scheduled for the patient okay. because of the many things. So in between, we have to keep the child on the chemotherapy. Okay. So that so you had planned for yeah. the cycles of IAC. Yeah, however, the child could not yeah, be yeah, given the for yeah. the All right. And the uh, three children who um, yeah. So uh, the, uh, the, the three children happened. in which the death happened. Mm -hmm. The two is from the group D eyes, mm -hmm. and one is from group B. What was the interval bet uh, between the last so therapy I, uh, so and the... So the, the two group DI patient, the uh, patient did not improve after the IAC. It basically get worsened. And so we advised the inoculation to the patient. So however, the patient was not okay. compliant to the inoculation and patient lost to the follow-up. And then it come, uh, come at the stage four. In one patient, what happened? It was a completely regressed tumor. And uh, after that, uh, lock COVID lockdown happened. And it was the UA was scheduled after four weeks. But however, the child come after... Uh, like two months yeah. and that time it was a very bitterous hemorrhage again we have given the next isc but it was not responding we had, uh, we did inoculation and after that the adjuvant chemotherapy but after that six months the child presented with the meds all right yeah okay thank you thank you okay next is uh, by dr uh, newit lomi on uh, ruthenium 106 uh, episcleral brachytherapy in ocular tumors experienced from a tertiary center. Yeah. So very good morning to you all. So I'll be speaking on ruthenium 106 <laughs> plug brachytherapy in ocular tumors from an experience from a tertiary center. So I have no financial interest to disclose. So we all know that for the past two decades in, in our country also, the bracket therapy has been widely accepted uh, treatment modalities for most of the ocular tumors. And the advantage is that the treatment is targeted to the tumor and the radiation exposure to the surrounding structure is minimal with minimal side effect. And the radio isotope commonly used in our country is iodine 125 and return 106. So uh, the aim and objective of this uh, study is to report our experience on episcular routine 106 plaque brachytherapy for different ocular tumors with regard to globe salvage, tumor control, visual outcome, and complications. So it is a retrospective intervention case series conducted at Dr. RP Center, Ames, New Delhi. For a study uh, was uh, taken from uh, April 2017 to June 2020, and an appropriate institutional clearance and concern were taken. We use the Rutinum 106 uh, baby plaque in all our cases. So uh, coming to the inclusion criteria, we, uh, the, uh, we include uh, this, the tumors of apical thickness less than six millimeter and the larger basal diameter of 15 millimeter. And for reg regarding retinal blastoma, uh, we have done the, uh, the secondary bra uh, brachytherapy on patients which are refractory to this uh, systemic chemotherapy after six cycle or with or without any focal therapy. And uh, for the ocular surface tumor for uh, with, with margin positive on histopathology and with the scleral impression we've seen on intersecting obesity and UBM. On uh, exclusion criteria were those active vitreous or sub -retinal, retinal, retinal blastoma seeds, painful blind eye, orbital involvement, pre-treatment system metastasis and previous uh, radiotherapy. So uh, the dosimetry calculation was done using an Excel sheet manual calculation by a medical physicist. So what are the parameters which they, uh, they requires like uh, the tumor dimensions, uh, the location of tumors, the measurement of tumor distance from optic nerve and the fovea. And based on it, they, uh, 
they calculate the duration of the plug in situ and then the shape and size of the, of the plug is uh, decided. The standard uh, procedure was carried out in all the cases under the supervision of the radiation safety officer. And in follow-up, the best character visual equity were assessed, the detailed ocular examinations were, uh, and the radiation-related complications were observed. Ultrasound was done for the local tumor uh, measurements and the yearly PET CT scan was done on a whole body to rule out any system metastasis. So this is the result uh, uh, of our case series. Uh, retinal blastoma, we have 18 eyes, choroidal meloma, 13 eyes, choroidal hemangioma, 15 eyes, and OSSN, 8 eyes. And, uh, and our average follow-up of around 20, 25 uh, months for retinal blastoma, choroidal meloma, around 20.69, and choroidal hemangioma, around 30 months, and then OSSN, around 13 months. So the, the main dose uh, of radiation, those are apex for retinal blastoma is around 40 gray, and then for choroidal melanoma is around 80 degree, and hemangioma is around 40 degree, and OSSN is around 60 degree. So uh, the, the tumor apical uh, thickness is around 3.6 millimeter uh, for retinal blastoma, for melanoma is around 5.4 millimeter, and choroidal hemangioma is around 4.4 millimeter, and OSSN around 0.6 millimeter depth in, of scleral involvement. So coming to, uh, to these outcomes of retinal blastoma, we found that the visual equity and IP, there was no cl clinically significant difference in baseline and 12 months follow up, similarly in choroidal melanoma too. However, in case of this uh, tumor dimension, in case of basal uh, uh, diameter and also apical thickness, we, we do see this, the change in decrease in the tumor uh, dimension. And also, in, in when uh, we see in case of choroidal hemangioma and OSS also, here also we, fo we do found uh, no clinically significant uh, difference in baseline and 12 months in, in terms of visual equity and inter intraocular pressures. However, the basal dimension uh, and then apical thickness was clinically significant was seen in baseline and 12 months uh, follow-up. Um, the average globe salvage rate in, in retinal blastoma is around 77 persons, uh, choroidal melanoma around 76.9, OSSN is around 62, and hemangioma is around 100 percent. The average local tumor control rate at 12 months is around 75 percent in, in retinal blastoma cases, and choroidal melanoma is around 66.6 percent, .6 and OSSN around 62.5, and then hemang uh, hemangioma is 100 percent. Coming to complication, we found four cases of proliferated retinopathy, uh, which was subsequently uh, subject to inoculation in case of retinal blastoma. For melanoma, one uh, one case has uh, distant metastasis, and which was subsequently uh, really uh, he got expired. That there were three radiation retinopathy, and uh, in all session there were two recurrences, uh, local recurrences, and one or orbital invasions. And in choroidal hemangioma, there's two radiation retinopathy. So we reviewed the literature, we found that in, in one study by Scurriel et al. in 2006, uh, where it, uh, they had done plug bracket therapy using retain 106 and 134 patients with a mean tumor thickness of 3.7 millimeter. Here, the five years tumor control rate is 94.4 persons and preservation rate, uh, globe preservation rate is 86.5 persons. Another study by Masood et al. Uh, on 21 eyes of circumcised coral hemangioma with tumor thickness of 3.7 millimeters. So uh, after one year, they have shown a good response in this case also. Uh, another study by Lomad et al. in 2000, where uh, they have done 141 eyes on the posterior uvula melanoma with a medium uh, mean tumor thickness of 2.7 millimeter. We have shown a local tumor control rate of 63.2 percent and an IS service rate of 65.6 percent. So here's a study, uh, here's a picture, clinical picture of our case where uh, a plug bracket therapy was done and this is the 16 month post, uh, post bracket therapy doing a good regress response. Another case of choroidal melanoma, uh, after 13 months follow up, patient is uh, uh, the tumor response is quite uh, uh, quite good in this case also. In case of diffuse coral hemangioma with serious detachment, we found a good response here again uh, in this case, and 18 months post, uh, uh, post bracket therapy. Another case of OSSN post uh, surgical excision followed by the uh, bracket therapy. 11 months follow up, the patient is doing well now. So in conclusion, with proper care selection and experience, retain 106 plug break therapy is a promotion modality for an effective eye and vision sparing alternative to inoculation for patients of intraocular tumors with a good overall tumor control and globe salvage rate. So the limitation of our study is it's a retrospective study design, a small sample size, and a short duration of follow-up. 
So these are my, our references, and um, thank, I thank all these graduate therapy team under the guidance of Professor Bhavna Chawla, and also acknowledge our, uh, our radiation oncologist, Dr. Sushmita Petty, and Dr. Subramani, our RSO. Thank you. Thank you, that was a nice presentation. Okay. Uh, uh, just one question. I noticed you had a couple of patients of radiation retinopathy in the uh, coronary hemangioma group, and your uh, mean uh, radiation dose provided was around 40 gray. Yeah. So, uh, would you comment upon if, because for be being a benign tumor and the aim of treatment being stabilizing uh, the uh, tumor dimension and reducing and basically stabilizing visual activity, would you like to reduce the uh, dose provided for coronary hemangiomas, considering radiation retinopathy post would need further treatment. Yes, uh, uh, basically we have seen one case in. Uh, yeah, I think we, uh, I remember one case only in case of uh, coronary hemangioma where this radiation retinopathy was there. So in that pa patient, we have done standard dose of uh, forty gray uh, was given in the epical uh, the, the dose, and. and I don't know how their uh, tumor responds differently with the different patient might be, but we do see this in this case, particular case, um, maybe the, that patient was associated with uh, hypertension and diabetic also, maybe that had uh, uh, increased the chances of getting radiation retinopathy. Sure. Possibly, yeah. yeah. Great, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Dr. Rolika. So next will be by, uh, presentation will be by Dr. Rolika on correlation of risk factors and adjuvant therapy in the era of secondary enucleation in retinoblastoma. May I begin, ma'am? Okay. Good morning, everyone. So this is a topic pretty close to all our hearts, and that is uh, I'll be talking on correlation of risk factors and adjuvant therapy in the era of secondary enucleation for retinoblastoma. So we all know that retinoblastoma has a significant incidence and uh, high fatality rate if untreated. And uh, in Asian countries like ours, uh, delay in diagnosis leads to advanced disease at presentation. Lack of access to advanced medical facilities is there and we have absence of standard management protocols at all the centers. We have seen earlier that uh, secondary enucleation, um, uh, so treatment in so, um, retinoblastoma advanced cases led to a 44%, 43% of eye salvage, which is a significant number. But what about metastasis? Uh, what about how to timely diagnose retinoblastoma? Is there a way to identify the risk factors? And is clinical identification possible? <laughs> so we went on to study that. So here is a case, two and a half year old child presented with secondary glaucoma. And uh, she was treated with neoadjuvant uh, chemotherapy, six cycles. And uh, residual tumor was seen overlying the optic nerve head and the macula. On enucleation, there was um, still thickness was there in optic nerve, there was involvement. And histopathologically proved uh, that uh, optic nerve invasion was present. So we were able to put it all together. And we saw that what about studying the clinical risk factors and as to pathological risk factors and finding a correlation. So let's see what would the clinical risk factors be. Iris neovascularization, secondary glaucoma, sterile orbital inflammation, AC seeds, hyphema, and bufthalmus. These are the six possible clinical risk factors and we put them all together. At the same time, we put together iris infiltration, choroidal invasion, retrolaminar involvement, optic nervous sector dental involvement, here the meningeal involvement is seen, lamellar scleral involvement, and extrascleral spread. So we put together histopathological risk factors. But what about a correlation between the two? What about correlating the clinical risk factors and histopathological risk factors? Is it possible? So we put them together. And what we found was that, um, so we put them together by studying uh, 920 enucleated eyes. We included all the cases undergoing secondary enucleation, and we ruled out the baseline metastasis patients and loss to follow-up were also taken out. 
So we saw that secondary enucleation was in, uh, present in, uh, was done in 44% cases and clinical risk factors were present in 60% and histopathological risk factors were present in 30%. Most commonly, the histopathological risk factors were choroidal invasion and optic nerve extension was also seen in 22% cases. This is, not a less, this is not a small number. And out of these cases, clinical risk factors were present in iris, like being iris neovascularization is common, secondary glaucoma being common, sterile orbital inflammation along with AC seeds, high FEMA, and bufthalmus. And we saw that there was a common, uh, common point, and that was that risk factors were present clinically and histopathologically in 22% cases. And we went on finding a correlation, and we saw that the p-value was significant. So when we see a clinical risk factors, we have a high chance of getting a histopathological risk factors despite neodymium chemotherapy. We assessed all the histopathological risk factors and went on to study the uh, AJCC staging of those patients only. And we saw that the most common, uh, the metastasis related death was seen in the radiological optic nerve extension proven patients or the ones which presented with proptosis and opt orbital mass uh, at pre clinical presentation. Previous studies have been done on primary enucleation but, uh, and secondary enucleation individually. However, a correlation of the secondary, in secondary enucleation as a correlation of clinical risk factors and histopathological risk factors has been done now. And we have seen that our patients received neoadjuvant chemotherapy in all cases, adjuvant chemotherapy in all cases, and we saw a 99% life salvage in all our patients. And the ones which had histopathological risk factors had 95% life salvage. So to conclude, adjuvant chemotherapy was given in all. Radiotherapy was additionally given in 8% cases. Clinical risk factors and histopathological risk factors were common in 22% cases. And it is a correlation. And uh, at a follow-up of nearly 10 to uh, 12 years, we have seen that life salvage was achieved in 99% cases with uh, 95 percent in the histopathological risk factors patients. So this does help in predicting metastasis and facilitating life salvage. So that's the correlation we wanted to establish and these are our references. Thank you. All right. So uh, thank you. That was really a very large series and uh, uh, great work there. I have one question. You uh, this series included cases that underwent a secondary enucleation. Yes, ma'am. So that means that uh, they were all treated with some form of systemic chemotherapy, yes, I assume. So uh, systemic chemotherapy prior to enucleation is known to downstage the histopathology. Uh, so uh, my question would be, how did you take into account the histopathological risk factors when you were considering these eyes? Okay, ma'am. Thank you for the question, ma'am. You are right that it downstages the histopathological risk factors. That's why we did not even assess separately the staging of pathologically, like, you know, the PTNM staging of histopathological risk factors has not been commented on, as we cannot comment on the same. However, the histopathological risk factors in primary enucleation have shown that there, is, there are studies where we, uh, the uh, histopathological risk factors are based on that. However, in secondary enucleation in our cases, we do have to comment on certain risk factors which are present. Like for example here, I've mentioned extrascleral invasion is present, choroidal invasion is present. So most common was choroidal invasion. The second part that was optic nerve extension. So we have correlated it on the basis downstaging is definitely kept in mind, ma'am. Thank you. And uh, you might be having cases in this cohort where children might have received, uh, you know, maybe six cycles of chemotherapy and then again on histopathology you had high risk features. So how did you go on with your protocol of adjuvant therapy in such cases? Okay ma'am. Um, all the patients who were, uh, we saw histopathological risk factors, adjuvant chemotherapy of six cycles was given in all the cases. And along with radiotherapy that I've mentioned in 10 cases where we had expected optic nerve extension beyond or if there was any intracranial extension residue which was shown in radiology. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah. No, you can ask. No problem. <laughs> yeah. At presentation. No, sir. At presentation. Yeah. At presentation. Yes. And then, and was there a subset of patients who after chemo? 
did not have histopathological risk factors. Yes, sir. And then what was the treatment for them based on? Uh, the patients who did not have histopathological risk factors after giving the initial set of uh, chemotherapy, they were not treated with further adjuvant uh, chemotherapy. They were kept on a follow-up. They, they, they may have had risk factors. Right. That would have been downstaged by that. So right. had the child been risk, had we initiated initially, histopath would have shown that the child needed adjuvant chemo. But since you've already given adjuvant chemo, there is right. some and possibly things like maybe scleral invasion, which would then additionally necessitate radiation, would not show up in a wounded patient. That's right, sir. That's yeah. why that at the uh, yeah. long follow-up also, those patients were kept on regular follow-up, that there was no metastasis despite that. That's the point that you're trying to make. Yeah, masking is a concern. Mm -hmm. So any patient who we normally treat with chemotherapy and then subject them to enucleation, uh, you know, regardless of what the histopathology is after enucleation, we tend to continue with the recommended protocol for chemotherapy in such cases. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Next is a, a keynote address by Dr. Uh, Akshay Nair on ocular um, orbital mass as presenting sign of underlying malignancy, clinical pathological features and outcomes. So I think both the speaker and the judges are relaxed now. <laughs> <laughs> no marks <mask> business. <laughs> and I'm also relaxed because no questions. <laughs> business. So no, that we, is so true. <laughs> we are under more stress. Yeah. And thankfully, no timing. What about this? We have to score. We have to score. So it's after, after his talk. Her talk is after this talk. Mm. How's his last? Uh, Shweta's talk is actually uh, the best paper award at the state conference, uh, Uttarakhand State Ophthalmological Society, a leopard cannot change its spots. So we are wa waiting to hear why. At the outset, I would like to thank AIOS for giving me the opportunity to present this case. A 67-year-old female first presented to us in 2010 with bilateral diminution of vision uh, and low-grade vitritis in the right eye. Apart from a positive MANTU test, no other systemic in investigations were positive. After a course of topical steroids, vitritis had subsided after eight weeks. She, it was then followed by an episode of optic neuritis in the left eye three months later, which also subsided with a standard treatment with steroids. She had two more episodes of bilateral low-grade vitritis in the following year that responded well to treatment with oral and topical steroids. A detailed uveitis panel each time was non-contributory. Subsequently, she underwent cataract surgery in the left eye. She was then lost to follow-up for about seven years and returned in January 2021 with bilateral diminution of vision and floaters for a year. And uh, vision had dropped drastically in the right eye. And uh, she had AC cells 2 plus and WIT cells 2 plus. Media was hazy in the right eye. There was advanced glaucomatis cupping in both eyes with extensive RP alteration at the posterior pole, more prominent in the left eye. And the swept source OCT at this time showed epiretinal membrane in both eyes with subretinal fluid in the right eye so we can't, uh, and subretinal hyperreflective material between the RP and the Brooks membrane yeah. in the left eye, as seen in the image below. 
leopard spot appearance was confirmed on autofluorescence and so on fundus fluorescent angiography. It was more prominent in the left eye. She had a normal peripheral blood smear and a uh, few nodular opacities in bilateral lower lung zones. And CSF analysis and bone marrow preparation did not show any evidence of lymphoma infiltration. The PET CT scan of the whole body revealed few hypermetabolic mediastinal and hyalur lymph nodes, which on biopsy showed reactive lymphadenitis. She underwent a diagnostic vitrectomy in the left eye, which showed atypical lymphoid cells with few mature lymphocytes and macrophages. And B cell markers were all negative. T cell markers were positive in a few cells. And the features were su suggestive of a lymphoma. These are her slides showing, showing atypical lymphoid cells. And uh, IHC markers, CD20 is negative and CD3 is positive. A diagnosis of bilateral primary vitro-retinal lymphoma of T-cell origin with ocular involvement only was made. She received intravitreal methotrexate injections over the course of an entire year, 25 injections per eye, and she experienced corneal epitheliopathy and transient IOP rise, which were managed well with topical medication. At the end of a year-long follow-up, these are her images, and we can see that she is in remission with resolution of the hyperreflective material and the SRF. Intraocular lymphoma is of two types, primary and a secondary IOL. The most common form of uh, PIOL is PVRL. Around 80% of PVRLs involve the brain subsequently, while 20% of PCNSNL PCN will develop PVRL later. More than 95% of PVRL are non-Hodgkin's diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, and less than 5% are T-cell origin. Uh, they are more common between uh, the age of 50 to 60 years and more common in females, and clinically it is not possible to differentiate between the two. And on fundus examination, signs to look out for include vitritis in string of pearls pattern, vitreous sheets, aurora borealis pattern, subretinal infiltrates, and uh, on OCT, we need to look for subretinal hyperreflective material and the leopard spot appearance on autofluorescence and fundus fluorescent angiography. The gold standard for diagnosis is histopathology and IHC. It is imperative to withhold steroids uh, two weeks before the vitrectomy, before the diagnostic vitrectomy to prevent, to avoid the lympholytic effect of steroids. And the challenge, and diagnosis is challenging considering the limited fragile specimen and the low number of neoplastic lymphocytes previous treatment with corticosteroids and the skill and the experience of the cytopathologist. All these result in a high uh, rate of false negative biopsies. And recent recommendations include uh, less invasive methods such as an aqueous tap to detect certain mutations. So actually we're running short of time. Can sure. you wrap can up? Add, yeah, sure. Please. Treatment options for bilateral PBRL are not um, standardized and uh, they include intravitreal methotrexate and rituximab. And systemic options include chemotherapy and radiotherapy. And these are the characteristic OCT findings to look out for. And uh, as we know, the diagnosis is challenging, often masquerading as chronic uveitis or vitritis. And it is delayed due to lympholytic effect of steroid therapy. And it is necessary to look for imaging biomarkers such as hyperreflective subretinal infiltrate, sub-RP deposits, RP undulation, clumps of vitreous cells, and the leopard spot appearance. Thank you. Thank you. Nice presentation. Thank you. Thank we you. move on to Akshay's presentation. Akshay, are you ready? Thank you. Uh, so my talk is titled Orbital Mass as the Presenting Sign of an Underlying Malignancy, the Clinical and Pathological Features with Outcomes. We have no conflict of interests. 
So what do we already know about orbital metastasis is that one, they form close to one to three, 13 percent of the of all the orbital tumors that are uh, excised. Also, we know that during the natural course of cancer, two to five percent of cancer patients may develop orbital metastasis, which is usually by hematogenous spread, with breast, lung, and prostate being the most common primaries. Now, in patients who have a diagnosis or who are diagnosed with orbital metastasis, long-term studies have shown that the mean survival after diagnosis of an orbital lesion is 15.6 months. But the duration from diagnosis of the original cancer to the diagnosis of an orbital mass is somewhere in the range of 52 months, which is almost five years. But what about 15% of these cases in whom the orbital mass is the initial presentation of disseminated cancer where the patient does not know that they already have a lesion or a cancer. So in this subset of patients where the orbital lesion is the first presenting symptom, what we don't know is how common is it in developing countries, what is the most common presenting symptoms, the most common primary and outcomes and prognosis, which is why this study was conceived to describe the clinical features and outcomes of patients presenting with orbital metastasis as the first sign of an underlying malignancy. This was a retrospective case review where we had 30 cases of diagnosed orbital metastasis of which 20 already had a previous diagnosis of a cancer. But in 10 patients, there was no pre prior history of a cancer which meant that these cases were the ones where the orbital lesion was the first presenting symptom. The mean follow-up for this entire series was 7.9 months. In the subset of these 10 patients in whom the orbital lesion was the first presenting feature, the lung was the most common primary followed by breast, prostate, gallbladder and colon. Uh, the male, male to female ratio was 2 is to 3 and the mean age at presentation was 68 years. The most common presenting symptoms were proptosis followed by diplopia, swelling, pain and redness being the next symptoms. The mean duration from the initial orbital symptom to diagnosis was 2.25 months and every patient underwent a thorough metastatic screen including a PET CT scan and the mean number of metastatic sites involved at diagnosis in addition to the primary was 3.3. Surprisingly though, 7 out of 10 patients had no systemic complaint which could have pointed to a primary. Three other patients had one, patient, one complaint each of lower back pain, constipation and severe headache. Eight patients underwent an incisional biopsy of the orbit. One patient developed an acute abdomen at the same time and uh, underwent a laparotomy which showed the primary to be a gallbladder tumor. One patient who had simultaneous CNS involvement from a primary of a breast underwent a CSF examination which came positive for malignant cells from the breast. All 10 patients received chemotherapy. Our results suggest that the disease had a very aggressive course with 4 out of 10 patients undergoing radiation and 3 undergoing palliative surgery for treatment of the primary lesion. During the course of the uh, follow-up, 8 out of 10 patients died due to the disease and in these, this smaller subset of patients who died due to the primary disease, the duration of uh, between the diagnosis of the orbital lesion and death was only 5.8 months. Uh, there are a couple of index cases. This is a 52-year-old female with proptosis of the right eye for two months with sudden onset diplopia and pain. Uh, imaging shows a fairly well-defined intraconal with spillover to the extraconal component, a mass with variegated appearance. An incisional biopsy was done which came out to be melanoma. So our working diagnosis was a primary melanoma of the orbit. And during a metastatic workup, it was relieved, revealed that she had a, a tennis ball sized primary melanoma of the rectum which had metastasized to multiple spots all over including the orbit. This was a case of a 67 year old male who had sudden onset pain, proptosis and diplopia was being treated elsewhere as myocysticercosis. Uh, MRI showed a, a well defined mass with an infarct necrotic central lesion an incisional biopsy showed a primary adenocarcinoma of a lung 
again metastasis showed liver in liver metastasis uh, pet ct showed metastasis in the liver and multiple lymph nodes being affected this was a patient who had come from africa and was referred as a lacrimal gland tumor with a three month history of pain double vision and proptosis there was bony lysis with an infiltrating infiltration type of lesion an excisional biopsy was attempted but it could only debulk and it was an uh, the meta, uh, histopathology suggested to be a breast carc carcinoma. As you can see, the liver, the lung, and the breast all showing hot spots on PET CT. So, the mean survival in literature, if you look at data from the West, the mean survival of cancer patients who've been diagnosed with orbital metastasis is 31 months. But our cohort of patients in whom the orbit was the first lesion, the mean survival is only 5.8 months. This is another series where they had a th one third of the patients with no known primary. But most of the papers suggest that there is no significant difference in survival in patients in whom a known primary is known versus an unknown primary at the time of diagnosis of an orbital lesion. This was again the same similar findings from another paper from UK. However, in our study, patients with a known diagnosis of cancer and an orbital metastasis that survival period was 12.3 months and in those without a known primary the survival was 5.8 months which is less than half and obviously significantly different uh, on, on radiological features there was nothing particularly a characteristic of these lesions although diffuse infiltration into the muscles was seen in seven out of ten patients and most lesions were unencapsulated so is there a case for us to treat all patients or adults with orbital lesions as orbital metastasis unless otherwise proved as long as they have the following red flags which is a recent onset of abaxial proptosis with diplopia pain and no evidence of inflammation so to summarize in india systemic malignancies presenting as orbital masses is possibly more common than expected these patients have poor prognosis with significant shorter survival and as they present later on during the course of the disease, more metastatic sites are involved. PET CT of course is crucial to stage the disease. In patients who present with the red flags of sudden onset diplopia with pain without inflammation, we should have a low threshold for biopsy which is based on imaging. And palliative treatment may be considered as an option given that we know the outcomes in these patients is very, very poor. Thank you. Thank you, Akshay. Thanks, ma'am. Very informative. So that concludes the session. And my apologies on behalf of the panel to all the speakers and panelists of the next session for running behind schedule. I wish you all a great day ahead.